Today, we're going to go to Panama for exactly one day, or at least 12 or so hours. Today I'm flying from Medellin to Montevideo with a stopover in Panama City. I chose a layover of about 12 hours to give me ample time to get out of the airport and take a quick tour. Copa Airlines, which is Panama's national carrier, acts as a gateway between North and South America. And much like TAF Air Portugal, Turkish Airlines, and Iceland Air, they have their own stopover program where you can get out and see the city during your travels. Now this is something that I've always wanted to do, and finally my opportunity came. Uh, however, I jumped into this whole thing doing no research on Panama, and so you can learn from my discoveries and mistakes along the way. And here's my Copa Chariot, the Boeing 737 MAX 9. The funny thing about the Boeing 737 MAX 9 is at the time of this video, two weeks prior, an Alaskan Airlines 737 MAX 9 made an emergency landing after its door plug blew out midair. This case, a Boeing 737 MAX 9 in row 26, where there could have been a door, this plane did not. Video showing that massive hole with the plane 16,000 feet in the air, packed with passengers. FAA temporarily grounding certain aircraft for inspection, impacting Alaska and United Airlines. Luckily, I was seated in an emergency row, so I'd be the first out the door during an evacuation, or if the door blew out on this plane as well. But as luck would have it, we landed uh, without any rapid cabin depressurization. Now we're wasting no time. As soon as I got off the plane, I ran to Migraciones to enter the country. When you've only got 12 hours, every minute counts, and you want to get in front of your fellow passengers getting off that plane. In this first line here, you have to present your passport, they ask me simple questions like where are you coming from, what's your plan in Panama, etc. And as soon as I got my passport stamped, I ran through to cut the custom side, which is the second line. Now here's where I made a mistake, don't be me. On the plane they passed out entry forms, but they asked my destination was Panama or a connection. I said a connection, which was true, and then it gave me a form, but I waited in this line and I needed to fill out the form to enter the country. So I waited in line and had to exit the line, go fill out the form, and then wait in line again. Luckily, you can find these forms at desks all around the baggage claim. Finally, I re-entered the line, passed my bags through a scanner, and officially entered the country. This whole process took about an hour. Uh, it's about noon now, and we're making pretty good time. Now, to maximize my time, I planned on using Ubers. There's a comprehensive bus and metro system in Panama City, but every minute counts, and so I decided to buy a SIM card to give me a phone connection. This SIM card has unlimited data for 24 hours. It was a hefty $20, but unfortunately convenience has its price. Now the airport has a spot where you actually leave bags for the whole day. So I arrived at Terminal 2, but the luggage storage is in Terminal 1. So to get to the shuttle, you have to exit if you arrive in Terminal 2, uh, exit the doors and head all the way to the right, and you'll find a shuttle stop. Here's the luggage storage location at the entrance of Terminal 1. Here's the prices for items listed in English and Spanish. For my carry-on size backpack, which counts as a suitcase, it was $5 per day. With my newfound phone service, I got an Uber and headed straight to the canal, which is the gem of Panama. And as you can see, it's about 35 minutes away from the airport. I had an absolute gem of an Uber driver. He was super friendly. He explained a bit of the history of Panama, how the canal worked, and how apparently the waters from the uh, Atlantic and Pacific Oceans actually don't mix. Um, he told me a bit about the neighborhoods that we passed through, and all while Whitney Houston was playing in the background, as you can hear here. It's always captured my attention how built up and urbanized Panama actually is, and seeing it in person really put it into perspective. I arrived to the Miraflores Visitor Center, which is one of the official visitor centers of the Panama Canal. Here from the observation decks, you can view ships passing through the locks. I arrived at roughly 1 p.m., but the first ships weren't expected to pass through around 2.30 p.m. I didn't know this, but there's a schedule you can see ahead of time if you're trying to plan your visit more efficiently. They have a cafe and an IMAX theater, which has a 40-minute movie, which is included in the price of your ticket. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to go see the movie. I took the time to have a lunch of tequeños, which are Venezuelan snack food, fried dough and cheese in the middle, and a water, all for nine US dollars. And those things sat really heavy in my stomach. Finally, the boats were coming, and so I ran outside to reserve my spot amongst the crowd. To me, the whole thing was absolutely hilarious. There was an announcer explaining the steps in both English and Spanish, and the crowd was going absolutely wild over infrastructure for international sea commerce. At this time, we're moving the water side to side. From the observation deck, you have a clear view of the locks. We waited about 10 or so minutes for the lock to be drained, and then the ships ascended to lower elevation before the lock opened. 
In the event that you're not familiar with how canals work, typically they connect two bodies of water, in this case the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Cutting across the land, the canal takes advantage of connecting natural bodies of water in order to shorten the transit time. But as we can see here, there are several changes in elevation, and locks, which are similar to water elevators, are placed at various points along the canal to traverse spans of differing elevation. And right now we're at the Miraflores locks, and these are the locks right before entering the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> And finally you can see the locks opening here. I sped it up because it's quite a slow process. Apparently these locked doors and motors are the originals from over a hundred years ago. Eventually once 2.30 rolled around, uh, we got to see some ships come through including this pretty big uh, container or oil vessel right here. And here we can see on the sides there's these tracked vehicles which help keep the vessel in the center of the lock. Basically the boat moves under its own power, or the ship, um, and then these ropes keep the ship centered. The Panama Canal is of personal interest to me as my own hometown, Rochester, New York, was once one of the most important stops along an earlier canal project, the Erie Canal. Finished in 1825, the Erie Canal connected upstate New York, and still does today, to the Atlantic Ocean. And you can think of it as America's first highway for transporting goods, which at the time was mostly just wheat. And in school growing up, we would take tours along the canal and take boat rides and go inside the locks. And so it was exciting for me to see the Panama Canal, which is basically the same idea, but on a much larger scale. But okay, the boats were fun, now it's time for part two of the trip, which is going to the old city. Again, I was blessed with a super nice Uber driver named Juan Carlos, in probably one of the most unique Uber vehicles I've ever had a chance to step into. I did not record that part, but I did ask him for a picture later on. You can see it's this uh, lifted Mitsubishi pickup truck in this bright blue color. You can't miss it. He was a really friendly guy, he shared with me a bit of history about the country, and he assured me the zone I was going to was safe, um, and filled with tourist police. The tourist police uh, apparently speak almost every language, including a famous one who was recently on the news for knowing Mandarin Chinese. ...de la Policía Nacional, José Valdés, y él tiene la particularidad, es trilingüe, no solamente habla español, sino también inglés y chino. Es correcto. Yo creo que... Ah, gracias a ti, chino, que hoy en día estamos en este programa. Gracias a ti. Now one thing about Latin America is that there are, we'll say, the Spanish word is conductor de confianza, or basically people that you can trust to give you rides. A lot of drivers, once you establish a good rapport with them, will give you the information in the event that uh, you need to get around. And so Juan Carlos gave me his um, contact information, told me, hey, you said you're going back to the airport later today. If you want a ride, I'll do it for 20 bucks. Just give me a 15 minute heads up. And after looking up how much it costs to get to the airport from where I was, it was a pretty fair price. Um, depending on the time, it might be a few dollars cheaper via the Uber app or a few dollars more expensive, so I said, why not? So here's his card if you're in Panama and you want to find a driver that you can confide in that gets you around safely, in style, in a unique vehicle, in comfort, and uh, is super friendly. So I was dropped off here at this Panama sign, which I just came to, to get the opening shot for this whole video. It is 3.55 and we are heading along this Oceanside Walk to the old part of the city. I've got about four more hours before I need to head to the airport. What you can't see is that it's disgustingly hot. The sun is extremely intense, even though it's covered by some clouds. The crazy thing is there's this bridge on the water which forms a ring all the way around, or actually 
they call it in Spanish a belt, all the way around the old city. A police officer from the Presidential Guard approached me and very nicely told me I'm not supposed to take photos of over there because apparently it is a presidential palace. So please enjoy the few seconds of illegal video that I took right here. And here's the old city. Now we're entering the old part of the city called Casco Viejo and it's one of the last remaining parts of the original Panama City left um, and so we're going to explore it for a few hours before I have to leave for the airport. One thing that stood out to me that I wasn't able to record very well is that there's a very heavy police presence on every corner. This is due to the number of government buildings in the neighborhood. Now if you've ever been to the walled city of Cartagena in Colombia, it does feel very similar. The streets are filled with this classic Spanish colonial style architecture that you see in many Caribbean countries. Now the area does feel a bit sleepy. It is a Monday evening, so I think that does likely explain it. Here's where on November 3rd, 1903, Captain Raul Chevalier fired the cannon shots forcing the retreat of Colombian forces from Bogota, which consolidated the independence of Panama. While you're here, we'll go over a quick history of Panama. So Panama is largely dependent upon the Panama Canal, or the history at least. Panama began its life as a Spanish colony for about 300 years until it was liberated by Simón Bolívar and became part of Gran Colombia in 1821, which included present-day Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, and Venezuela, and parts of Peru, and a little bit of Brazil, a lot of pieces. In 1831, the country fractured into a smaller New Granada, and eventually New Granada fractured leaving Colombia, which included this piece of Panama. Now for many years prior, the French had been exploring building a canal there, but the mortality rate of workers was insanely high from yellow fever and malaria. They didn't really know that mosquitoes were a disease vector. The US had been eyeing this project as well, but fearing US influence in the region, the Colombian government refused to cooperate with the Americans. So, the U.S., in all its glory and the policy of Latin American intervention, or speaking softly but carrying a big stick, um, decided to basically stoke nationalist sentiment in Panama and supported an armed revolt. And in order to protect it, they stationed U.S. troops in Panama, or basically invaded the country, to ensure the Colombian army couldn't take it back. And so in 1903, a nation was born. The U.S. was given total control over the canal project, with a lease granted until 2000. But in 1989, the U.S. invaded Panama again to depose unfriendly dictator Manuel Noriega, who had threatened the quote-unquote neutrality of the canal. And fellow citizens, last night I ordered U.S. military forces to Panama. No president takes such action lightly. I will leave the judgment up to you, the viewer, as to why the U.S. actually invaded. But enough about foreign policy, it's about 6 p.m. and time for me to grab an early dinner before heading to the airport. My first friendly Uber driver actually recommended this restaurant here called Diablicos. It's a devil-themed restaurant which represents the Diablos of Panama. So the devils are part of a celebration of Corpus Christi, um, which dates back to colonial times. And without going into too much detail, there's basically dirty devils or diablos sucios and clean devils or diablos limpios and these represent basically people who are unbaptized and those who are baptized and in some in s represents the the fight of good versus evil 
And so in this tradition, people dress up uh, with these masks and elaborate costumes, which you can see adorned on the walls in the restaurant. I came here to try some local Panamanian food, which includes this local beer brand, Ropa Vieja, which is, translates to old clothes, which is basically this tender stewed meat, coconut rice, and patacones. And patacones, if you're not familiar, are smashed and fried plantains, which they eat basically similar to potatoes in much of the Caribbean. The meal was a bit on the pricier side, coming out to 20 US dollars. I did just come from Colombia, where the price is a bit lower, so I was accustomed to that, I suppose. But it was getting late now, so I decided to check Uber, found out that my offer from Juan Carlos actually came out to be less, uh, so I decided to give him a call. And he said he'd be there in 15 minutes. There he is. And never short of interesting stories, Juan Carlos told me a bit about the history of Casco Viejo and showed me where American presidents and dignitaries had stayed and ate. The rest of the ride, Juan Carlos told me a bit about uh, recent turmoil in Panama involving protests over granting copper mining concessions to a foreign company in protected lands. Protestantes bloquearon varias vías el martes para exigir la derogación del contrato de operación de la mina de cobre más grande de Centroamérica. No toleraré vandalismo, ni llamados a la anarquía. The entire country turned upside down with road closures, which affected tourism, uh, civil disorder, and even a few deaths. However, only a month prior, the Supreme Court deemed the mining contract unconstitutional, putting an end to the violence. And I was amazed, considering myself worldly and well-informed, I'd never heard about this situation. Finally, I thanked Juan Carlos, and I told him I would give him a shout-out in this video. So again, if you need a driver in Panama, give him a call. Finally, I arrived at Terminal 1 to grab my bag. I took a shuttle to Terminal 2 and entered the airport. And luckily, I have priority pass, so I had access to the Copa Lounge. And our total spend for today is $137.32. Remember, you could probably get this to be a bit cheaper if you do plan ahead of time. Um, I spent a bit more just for the convenience. And if I hadn't mentioned, Panama was hot. It was about 32 degrees Celsius or about 90 degrees Fahrenheit and very humid. So I was sweaty, looked, and smelled horrible. Um, but luckily I was able to get the last shower for the evening. And there's no better feeling than taking a shower before a seven hour flight to Uruguay. And here we are at 8.46 p.m. The lounge closed at nine, but luckily my flight began running at 9.15. And there you have it, a single efficient day in Panama with an introduction to the country. So, hope you enjoyed it.